Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here today at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum President's Day Festival. I'm Kennedy Library Forum producer Liz Murphy. It's now my great honor to introduce our guest for this next segment. He'll speak uh, for a bit and then we hope at the end to have time for a question or two. If you could please ask your questions if you have them from those mics in the, in the aisles. Uh, that would be perfect when we get to that session, to that part of the session. Now, without further ado, welcome 26th President Theodore Roosevelt. President Roosevelt, welcome. Thank you for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you for joining me and welcoming our special guest. Thank you. I am delighted to be here with you folks this wonderful day, this great day. Every day is a great day. Every day is a wonderful day to get up and do that which is good and wonderful and puts blood in your veins and air in your lungs and gives you a reason to be thankful to walk this earth. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I, I introduce my aide-de-camp, Colonel Burr, who uh, goes with me on these trips, and a uh, very valuable young man to have. Uh, he was with me with the Rough Riders in Cuba, so I know his, I've tested his mettle, and it's, it's true and pure. However, what do I, folks, what, what do I talk to you about? I'm a, I'm a president, politician. You know, the most dangerous thing in the world is to ask a president a question because he's going to answer whatever is on his mind rather than what's on your mind. And so, you know, it's doubly dangerous to ask a politician because they don't shut up, if you've ever noticed. They, they, talking is their uh, defense or offense. But when I ask the good folks here at the library, what is it you want to hear Theodore Roosevelt to speak of this day? I mean, I've had a busy life. I can talk about being president. I can talk about being governor of New York. I can talk about being assistant secretary of the Navy. Um, uh, president of the New York City Police Board. I can talk about being a cowboy. I can talk about the Rough Riders. I always like to talk about the Rough Riders. But what is it that you good folks want to hear? I asked my host this, and I was, I was told in just a moment, you're spoiling my punchline. I was told Mr. Roosevelt, go ahead and talk about anything you want to talk about. Take as long as you want. By the time you get on stage, the good people of Boston will have been fed considerably warmer than they were before this morning and able to sleep through anything that you have to say. So with that ringing endorsement, I'll ask you, A what? The Rough Riders. Ah. Well, a little bit, because once I get started on the Rough Riders, their story is, is worth several hours of, of uh, good testimony. The, I will say this. The Rough Riders were the grandest group of men that I ever had the honor to serve with. True Americans, all. No matter race, color, creed, uh, they were as fine a fighting instrument as one could wish to go to battle with. They were a brave group. They were sort of rowdy at times. There was this time in San Antonio before we even got into any engagement in Cuba. We were in San Antonio, Texas, where our camp was. And <laughs> The uh, Rough Riders were invited to a concert by a local band in a local park. 
And it was festooned with all sorts of bunting and flags. Japanese lanterns by the hundreds were in the park. And it's a sort of a celebration of going off to Florida and then eventually to Cuba. The Rough Riders were enthusiastic to go, ready to go. And in honor of the event, the orchestra played some opera thing, or I don't know what, I don't know music, so it was just some opera thing. And, and the Rough Riders were so enthusiastic that when they came to the piece uh, in the music that it was titled The Cavalry Charge, the Rough Riders, to help the musicians out, drew their pistols and started shooting them in the air. And thus they destroyed about half the Japanese lanterns that were, were in the park. Uh, no one got hurt, fortunately, but it was a fun time. Uh, anyway, the, the Rough Riders in their enthusiasm showed that in the, in the battle, the fight at Las Guasima and the charge up San Juan Hill. Now, I will say this, because I'm going into a different direction than I intended to, and Colonel Burr here probably can, can back me up on all this. We went up San Juan Hill, July 1st, 1898. It was a hot day, exceedingly hot. Uh, the, the sun was beating down. It was easily 100 degrees, and we were wearing wool uniforms that were standard at the time. Uh, the Spanish were good shots. The American lines were really being hit hard, including including the, the Rough Riders. We were, we were actually in the bottom of the San Juan River that ran through the bottom part of the, uh, of the hill. And we, had, we took some casualties. Uh, we had one captain of uh, the infantry, Company A. Uh, he was walking up and down in front of his men on the bank of the river, on the bank nearest the Spanish lines. And they were shooting all around him. And his men were begging him to get down and to, to get under cover. You're sure to be killed. Captain, they were shouting, but he would have none of it because American officers lead. That's what makes Americans good soldiers. We tend to lead. We don't tell someone, go there and I'll be along later. Go there and face all the danger and I'll be along later. American officers say, follow me. Well, this officer... An excellent, excellent officer. Bucky O'Neill was his name, a, a ex-sheriff out in Arizona. He turned to his men and said, there isn't a Spanish bullet that can kill me. And as soon as he said that, he turned to face the enemy lines and a bullet went through his mouth and out the back of his head and he fell dead at the bottom of the hill. Well, with that and other reasons, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to have the Rough Riders just stay there and get shot. As I said, the Spanish were good soldiers, the good, the, the excellent marksmen. So I was determined to go and I tried to get orders to let the cavalry brigade charge up San Juan Hill. Uh, no, the, the plan was for the infantry division over on the far right to do the charging and get all the glory. Which, you know, that, those were the orders. I was refused two times to let the, the, the third time I determined we're going to go. Doesn't matter what the orders are. We're going to go. We're not going to sit here and take those casualties. So I got the Rough Riders up and ready to go. And seeing us get up, the other five regiments of the Cavalry Brigade started to get up too. The, the uh, two uh, regiments of Buffalo Soldiers, 9th and 10th U.S. College uh, Cavalry, and then the 
1st, 3rd, and 9th Regiment of Regular Cavalry. And we started to move forward. And much like Indian warfare, we'd, we'd run a bit, take cover, fire, load, run a bit, take cover, fire. It wasn't really magnificent lines. It was just kind of all going up as best we could. We, we got to a place on the hillside where there's barbed wire uh, as obstacles. I couldn't get over it. Was, I was on Little Texas, my horse. As a matter of fact, I was the only person on that field on a horse. Uh, everybody else was walking. Uh, I got off the horse. Turned to Little Texas, sent it back across the field, in which it did go back to American lines. And in all that battle, Little Texas never received so much as a scratch. Men falling left and right all around him, and that horse makes it all the way across the battlefield. Well, I got over, as did other members of the regiment. We got over the entanglements, and we charged to a blockhouse where the Spanish soldiers were. We, there was a fight around the blockhouse. All of us, including myself, firing our, our pistols or rifles. We had uh, congratulated ourselves. We were standing around saying, what a bully fight. We're having a grand time here. The men did well. And then we realized the Spanish were still shooting at us. They were shooting at us from another hill over there. Then it was, then we realized we had captured the wrong hill. We had gone up the wrong hill. We didn't go up San Juan Hill. We went up Kettle Hill. <laughs> there wasn't anything to do but to go ahead, charge forward. And, and, and the men knew that. Instinctively, they men knew that and knew how to react to it. And so we charged down Kettle Hill, the other side, charged up San Juan Hill, which was actually a long series of ridges along the way. And we knocked the Spanish off of San Juan. And for a brief time, we were the owners of the trenches along San Juan Hill. And from there, we could look down on the city of Santiago. We were the, we, we'd captured the hills. It was a grand moment, a glorious moment that none of us will ever forget. There, there was obviously more to it, and there are other stories of, of the, of the uh, Rough Riders in Cuba. One was when I swam with the sharks, and when Mrs. Roosevelt heard that, uh, what I'd done from a lieutenant called Greenway, she said, well, Theodore, the Spanish can't shoot you, the mosquitoes won't bite you, and the sharks won't eat you. You must be destined for something else along the way. I guess it was true. And there, I'll, be, I'll get to you right real quick. I wanted to ask you that, you know, when the Rough Riders got done at the end of the day, the Army, uh, its organization was not the best in the world during those days. So the first doctors, the first nurses, uh, the first medical attendants came up a couple hours after we had captured San Juan Hill. And they had come up to help the casualties in the cavalry brigade. Do you have any idea who that first doctor was? A very famous person was the first doctor. Any of you care to take a guess who that doctor might have been? Clara Barton, who was over 70 years old. The Army couldn't get its act together. And this is not to disparage the Army, because I'm proud of the Army. But it wasn't very well organized. 
And so the first medical attention given to the Rough Riders and others was by Clara Barton, who, uh, although she was 70 plus years of age, uh, felt it her duty to be where there was pain and suffering. So we always remembered the role that she played. And she was always, um, what's the word? Always spatially uh, honored at the Rough Rider reunions. Now, you have been patient. What is your question? Um, you, mean, like, you invented the teddy bear, right? I invented the teddy bear? Did you? No. I didn't invent the teddy bear. I'm kind of the one who got the most out of a teddy bear. I named it. I, I named it. Actually, I can't even take credit for naming it. Somebody else liked it and named it for me. He, oh, well, would you like to hear the story of the teddy bear? Yeah. Well, we hadn't planned to do that, but I, I have so much fun. I had so much fun being president, living with the Roosevelt family in the White House. So it just kind of all goes over to the children. You know, we, we, we love to play games. Hide and seek in the White House is a great game to play. Uh, the The... Oh, snowball fights on the White House lawn. Oh, those were, were great. So we'd have all sorts of wonderful games. But I digress from the question about the teddy bear. Well, I guess this would be as good a time as any because people kind of like a president who is only six years old. And that's what uh, John Hay, my Secretary of State, would often tell people. He'd tell the, this to the press. He says, now, you must remember the president's only six years old. So, and I had fun. But I can't say the teddy bear story was necessarily fun. You see, in November of 1902, I had been invited to go to Louisiana to join in a bear hunt by two Mississippi plantation owners. I had never had a bear from Mississippi or anywhere really in, in the South. I kind of wanted one, kind of to fill out my trophy room, my collections. I had a grizzly. I, I had the brown bear of Maine, magnificent bear. I had some of the, the, the bears of the Midwestern woods, but I didn't have a Mississippi bear. So I have it, and I hadn't been hunting since I became president. I'd been stuck in the old office. I wanted to go hunting. So in November of 1902, I and my party took the train down to Mississippi, and we get off at a station called Smed's. It looked like a Smeds. It smelled like a Smeds. There's no reason to ever go to Smeds, Mississippi. But that's where the hunting began. We got off at Smeds, said thank our hosts and everything, and then we all proceeded to ride into the little sunflower area of the Yazoo River Delta. It was interesting. We hunted for five days. And for five days, I had the honor, as being the guest, of being the one allowed to shoot the first animal. Not much of an honor, because for five days, we didn't see any animals. There wasn't, we, we didn't, there was no bear, there was no deer, there was no raccoon, there was no uh, uh, possum, nothing. It was miserable hunting. Then one day, next to the last day, this is early November, Holt Collier, who was our, our guide, he said, Miss Roosevelt, why don't you and the party 
go into that copse of trees over there and rest in the shade of the tree. And it gets hot in Mississippi, even in November. We thought that was a, a capital idea. And so we proceeded to do so. Mr. Collier took the dogs, went into the swamp to see if he could drive out a, a, a bear. Well, we waited an hour, we waited two hours, we might have waited nearly three hours. There was no Hope call you, there was no dog and there was no bear. So I mounted my pony, rode back to the camp. I had no sooner gotten out of ear distance, hearing distance, than out of the swampy area came Hope Collier. In front of Hope Collier was a pack of yipping, snarling, rendering dogs. And the object of their attention was a bear. To complete this, I'm going to need the assistance of my aide de camp. Colonel Burr, you're on. Yes, I'm the commander in chief. Come right up here, sir. You look surprised to be picked, but in a way, you're the epitome of a Mississippi bear. The uh, now the bear, was it the magnificent grizzly, the ferocious brown bear of Maine? No, no. This bear was bedraggled, torn a little bit, bleeding a little bit. It was near starvation. We didn't need to kill the bear. We needed to feed it. But the bear came out and it was small and bent over and torn, really, really tired of, you know, it just, it, it was, it was pathetic. <laughs> Look pathetic, uh, Colonel. Thank you. The, it, they, the, the bear was not much of a bear, certainly not a trophy bear, but I didn't know that at the time. The bear had spirit though, for the dogs would, were lunging for it and drove it a little bit more into the marshy air. And as it, I said it had spirit, as the dogs lunged for it, the bear with a mighty swipe of the paw. <laughs> with a mighty swipe of the paw. Uh, now, now you know why he's in the army. He's a, uh, he's, he killed the dog, or one of the dogs. As he did so, Hope Collier stepped up with his rifle and cracked him on the back of the neck with it, with the butt of the rifle. And the bear was, became somewhat unconscious, tied a rope around the bear, and then he came over and he tried to rope to the tree. And he sent for Roosevelt to come and get his bear. Back at the camp, a writer came in saying, Mr. Roosevelt, we have your bear. That's all I needed to hear. I, I grabbed my rifle, mounted my pony, and rode back to the copse of trees. And when I got to the copse, I dismounted, ready to claim my trophy. But this is what was there. It was, was it the mighty brown bear? Was it the ter ferocious grizzly? Was it even the, the strong Midwestern black bear? No, it was this. And uh, like I say, it was pathetic. Uh, and I said, I will not shoot that bear. The bear looked more like it was ready to be put out of its misery than, than anything. And I said, no, I will not shoot it. This is not uh, honorable. This is nothing admirable that I've done. Uh, certainly not worthy of proclaiming as a trophy. I will not shoot it. And I mounted my pony and rode back to camp. Back in Washington, D.C., there was a political cartoonist named Clifford Berryman. And for weeks, he had been doing political cartoons of Theodore Roosevelt. 
And he had been, okay, thank you very much. Sometimes I see a time limit, sometimes I ignore a time limit. Uh, he had, anyway, Clifford Berryman had said, hey, I got an idea. I'll put this bear into one of my cartoons. And he did. And it was Theodore Roosevelt refusing to shoot the bear and became popular. He, did, he had no idea it would become as popular as it, did, as it did. But he knew he had stumbled upon something. And from that day forward, for the rest of his life, whenever he drew a political cartoon of Theodore Roosevelt or a cartoon with Theodore Roosevelt in it, he put the brown bear in it. Now, I might be out in the garden at the White House, and up on the windowsill will be a little brown bear talking to me. I might be walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, and alongside of me will be a little brown bear just skipping along. You don't have to skip, thank you. But wherever you saw Theodore Roosevelt, you saw the little brown bear. Now, an interesting thing, oops, excuse me, an interesting thing happened. The bear, instead of being bedraggled and torn and bleeding and skinny and starving and all that, with succeeding cartoons, the bear became softer and rounder and more furry and Okay, it came, it came, oh, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> I forgot where I got, the bear became rather and softer, it became, it had two button eyes and a button nose, and ladies, I'm going to tell you, it was adorable, it was just adorable, and people loved that cartoon. Now, up in New York City, the FAO to Schwartz Toy Company had ordered dozens, uh, hundreds if I'm not mistaken, uh, of brown Bavarian stuffed bears for Christmas. And they had sold hardly any. Across the river in Brooklyn at the Moore Schmitzkum Ideal Toy Company, they had dozens of Bavarian stuffed bears, and they had sold hardly any. Then Mr. Mitchum got an idea. What if I name these bears after Theodore Roosevelt? So he sent a letter to, Rose uh, to the White House. Uh, Dear Miss Roosevelt, I have these stuffed bears. I haven't been able to sell any. I think if I gave them your name, I'd sell some. Do you mind? Because... They had all heard the story of the bear in Mississippi. Well, I couldn't see how naming a bear Roosevelt would have make any difference at all. So I said, sure, go ahead. And he put a sign in his window that said, for sale, Teddy's apostrophe bear. And he sold every one of them. Across the river, F.A.O. Schwartz sold put a sign in their window, for sale, Teddy's apostrophe bear, and they sold out. Across the nation, Chicago, St. Louis, San Francisco, F.A.O. Schwartz did the same thing. Uh, for sale, Teddy's bear, and they, they sold them. They, well, thank you, Colonel, you can, go, you can sit down now, please. please. Don't. His ego is already big enough. To, uh, <laughs> F.A.O. Schwartz did this across the nation. Now, here, here's the, the million dollar question. Since then, since 1902, since Christmas of 1902, every Christmas, the most popular toy sold 
has been what do you think? A teddy bear, exactly right. The most popular toy in the world every Christmas is the teddy bear. Now, I'm a politician. I like anything that brings attention to me. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of nice if that's a part of your legacy as uh, being associated with a Bavarian stuffed bear. There's a lot more things that you can be talked about and, and not very nice, but I kind of like being, having that bear as a part of my legacy. Uh, now, with that, we, where are we at? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. I, I hate to kind of be rushing, come, but I, I like a Q&A, uh, and I like to give at least a couple minutes to, to anything. Do any of you have any questions of for? Oh yes, ma'am. What kind of bear? Was oh, it? what the, what kind the, of bear? What kind of bear was it down there in Mississippi? It was it was a small. Um, well, it was a brown bear. It wasn't a black bear. It was a a small brown bear. It uh, it would not have grown very large anyway. Uh, so you know, it's that's just the way it is. Some. Uh, Oh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. maybe this lady can get that for you. There you go. Thank you. Um, I have a question. All right. What exactly does speak softly and carry a big stick mean? Ah, speak softly and carry a big stick. And that's a, uh, by the way, reach in there uh, and get that, uh, 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 maybe I ought to reach. Oh. For being brave enough, excuse me here, I get this, there we go. For being brave enough to ask the first question, how about a gift for you about the presidents? Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, now the question, what does the phrase speak softly and carry a big stick? It's an old African proverb and it, it simply means, you know, you don't need to shout, yell, threaten, bully people. Uh, but when you, when you have a project you're working on, and you might kind of come into people who want to put an obstacle in your way, to get their attention, speak softly. On the other hand, let them know that if you need to use it, you got, let's say, a paddle. Sort of like when your parents tell you to go to bed and you don't want to go to bed. Uh, my dad, all he had to do is say, it's time to go to bed. And if I didn't, he had the big stick to, to, to learn me to do it. It's a, it's a way of dealing with people without really becoming violent about it. Just let people know where you stand on an issue. So here you go. I thank you for that. That's a, being brave enough to come up here and ask the question. Is there, is there any other question? Yes, sir. You're the man in the arena is required reading by grandchildren. Ah. I know what your, I know what your inspiration is, but I just wondered if you would give us your motivation for that. Well, that was, I believe that every man should be judged on his character, not on the group that he belongs to, not on the, uh, uh, the church that he may, may belong to. Uh, his character, is he a man of his word? Does he, does he say what he means, that, that sort of thing? And the idea is, if you have good character, then it's not the people who are speak against you that really matter. Is you know the idea? It's it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out where the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena. You will always have no matter what you do, you always have somebody that'll tell you why you shouldn't do it or you can't do it or a hundred reasons why it can't be done. 
These are not the people that you need to, to listen to. You need to, you need to give every effort. No, it doesn't matter if there's failure with that effort. There's no effort worth achieving that hasn't come with failure. That's a part of the great plan. You know, it's better to try magnificently and fail than to never try at all. And that's sort of a mantra to live by some <coughs> to a certain extent. So that's, that's a speech I gave at the Sorbonne in Paris, France, 1910. And being the politician I am, I've given a form of it probably 100 or 150 times since then. Uh, you know, if something sounds good, you better stick with it. Uh, is there any other? Yes. Approach or should I ask from here? Oh, I'm sorry. Should I approach the microphone or should I ask from here? No, this microphone. Right, this microphone. Oh, I, I'm not used to those newfangled things. Yeah. It's just. So I came a little late. I assume this is Archibald Butts here. Uh, no, he, he replaced Archie. You know, Archie went down on the Titanic. Titanic yes, but. And so, yeah, uh, I was going to warn him not to go on the Titanic, but my mother's family is from Augusta, Georgia, and your mother is from Roswell, Georgia. Yes. And you gave a talk in October of 2000, uh, 1905 in Roswell, Georgia. And those words I would not have said, let's put it that way, even though I'm half Southern and I can. So am myself, I. I know. And, <laughs> I consider myself from Massachusetts, and I've really always been confused by that talk yeah, oh, of, that okay. you gave. Well, that's, uh, I'm, I have been lucky. As president, I've been welcomed in all parts of the country, and I've been enthusiastically received and supported for the most part. But I have to admit, when it comes to the Deep South, they're not going to vote for a Republican if that's the only person on the ticket. And so you know, have to you have to accept it. But they went around and they cheered and entertained me and everything. They just wouldn't vote for me at the time. So right. that's a part of politics. Yeah, I just wouldn't have said what you said in October 1905. But. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we're cutting it all. Well, I thank you very much for having me here and listening to these few words. Uh, I will be glad to stand for photos or sign autograph cards if you want. So thank you very much.